The end of chapter 3, beginning of chapter 4, introduces to ancient astronomy. One of the questions, you know, that people always want to know is, you know, what do we know about the, the sky? What do we know about the universe? But I think it's also kind of interesting to understand how we got to this point. What did people used to think, and how did we come to know what we know? And that's kind of what the book is trying to do here at the end of Chapter 3, beginning of Chapter 4. The uh, book doesn't mention this, but I, you know, it's, or sort of mentions in passing, and that is that astronomy is one of the very first sciences. Uh, people would look up into the sky, and they'd wonder, you know, why... Is it sometimes bright and sometimes not bright at night? Why is the sun sometimes high in the sky, sometimes low in the sky? And so uh, in a cave drawing from, from ancient times in Europe, there's these, these marks here uh, uh, drawn on the, the wall of the cave with, with, um, with a soot. And that's believed to actually represent some of the dark markings that we see on the surface of the moon. Uh, the other thing that's interesting was that that they f they found uh, another place where you, there's this um, creature of some sort uh, and and surrounding it are 29 little smudges. Well, that would indicate uh, 29. What's special about 29? Well, the new moon is visible about every 29 and a half days. So that's almost, you know, a lunar sort of reference right there. In Africa, they found in several places uh, these bones that have little notches carved on them. And one side is 29 notches and the other side is 30 notches. Well, that's a lunar calendar. And so uh, keep keeping track of time. And of course, we also talked about how Stonehenge is a um, um, ancient megalithic structure here, uh, designed uh, most likely as a lunar calendar, and and keeping track of the cycles of the moon and the Saros cycle. It also keeps track of the cycles of the sun. Uh, at Stonehenge, you can all, there are also alignments there that seem to line up with the, the, uh, equ or the, the solstices. And so th this is another interesting sort of, of alignment that happens. It's not the only place that sort of thing happens. Uh, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in the United States uh, North America. Uh, this was a Native American site that that had astronomical alignments as well, alignments that that marked towards the the seasons and and not just the seasons, but there's also places here that line up with certain rising and setting of stars that rise or set at particular times of the year, corresponding to um, uh, the season to hunt various migratory animals or the season to plant things. There are several places uh, that have what are called sun daggers, uh, in which as the sun shines through a, a rock or something, it, it creates a, a, a uh, um, shadow or anti-shadow, because it's actually the sunlight shining through into a spot, and um, th this can be used to tell time. In fact, near Wichita Falls, Texas, is a symbol here that, that represents uh, several different tribes and uh, um, people. And then on one day out of the year, the sun ends up pointing right to the center of that. Well, that was a gathering day or a meeting day in which the, the different tribes would come together on the day that that happened, and they would have a, a conference among each other to maintain the peace. And so, uh, th this, again, the, the, these are things the ancient people figured out, that the sky is shifts a little bit every day, and you can keep track of time. In Egypt, the pyramids had astronomical alignments. Uh, they were aligned north, south, east, west. But in addition to that, uh, the Great Pyramid uh, in, in, in Egypt here uh, had an interesting sort of alignment that, that went with it. And that was that from the inner chamber, the burial chamber up to the surface, was a shaft uh, at kind of an angle like that. And 
when archaeologists found that shaft, they thought, well, this had something to do with ventilation, maybe, so that when it was building it, that it would ventilate that inner chamber for the workers. Uh, later scientists realized that it doesn't actually circulate air through the shaft, so it's not useful for ventilation at all. And so they began to wonder what it was for. They even sent a little robot up the shaft to see what it would do. And they realized that they still couldn't figure out what it was for. Astronomers, though, noticed that that shaft was pointed towards the spot in the sky where the star Thuban would culminate. Uh, so Thuban was the North Star when they built these pyramids, and that star, that shaft, would point to the spot in the sky where it would culminate or be the highest in the sky, because it wasn't exactly at the North Celestial Pole at the time. And so that was presumably a very significant thing. No one really knows what's significant about that, but that was a very significant thing that they, they apparently built that shaft pointed right at where that star was highest in the sky. And so uh, why? I don't know. Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem uh, from the Bible, it talks about uh, this temple, and uh, from for archaeology, we can see you know remnants here, and we see how it was oriented. And the interesting thing is the the Temple Mount, uh, you know, using stone tools, they flattened out the Temple Mount in such a way that they could build this temple there. And so the temple was not oriented north, south, east, west, but at a at a little bit different angle, and um, it was not oriented at an angle that was actually easy to build. They actually had to like level part of, of the, uh, the hill there to point it this way. And so there was very significant why they did that. Well, what was the significance? Well, it turns out that on this particular temple, uh, at the Day of Atonement, uh, uh, the, the uh, High Holy Day uh, for the Jews at the time, the sun would shine directly in to the Holy of Holies. And so uh, uh, on other days, the sun would shine in at different angles, but, but on that day or about that time of the year, it would shine right in to the innermost uh, uh, part of the, the uh, temple. And so this was done on intentionally. Uh, this was not an accidental alignment. There's plenty of other examples in history of this intentional alignment. Tombs that were lined up so that on certain days of the year uh, that the sun would shine in on the crypt of the king or something. Uh, there were other cases here. Uh, this is, was uh, Monte Alban in, in uh, Central America where they lined uh, buildings here that pointed directly at uh, the star Capella which was would be rising or setting at key times in the year. Uh, uh, you had to plant and harvest crops at certain times of the year, and so the heliacal rising and setting of certain stars marked those seasons right there. And so the heliacal rising of Capella, for example, time to plant certain things. Uh, they, we also knew that they, they, that they were understood about the seasons and the alignment with the sun. Uh, they had these ball courts that were lined up so that on certain days of the year, the sun would shine along the length of the court and right through the goals. Okay, And, and uh, then they'd play a ritual game in there. Uh, and then they would sacrifice the, the loser you know, uh, um, at the end of the game. Other places in Central America where, where astronomical alignments were very, very important, just outside of Mexico City, there's a place called Teotihuacan. And Teotihuacan, uh, is, it has several large structures in here, one of them being what they call the Pyramid of the Sun. Uh, and the Pyramid of the Moon. This is actually a picture taken from the top of the Pyramid of the Moon, looking down a street that went straight down there. And, and there were several little small, small buildings down here. And then there's the Pyramid of the Sun right here. The top of the Pyramid of the Sun and the top of the Pyramid of the Moon line up almost perfectly with north. So that was lined up perfectly to be north. Well, that one... That, that could have been done in a variety of different ways. They actually went to great effort to place these things exactly where they placed them. Um, 
so that they were lined up just right. They actually had a river that ran through this valley and using stone tools, they carved a new channel for the river so that it flow perpendicular to this street. Well, why not build the street perpendicular to the river? Well, because they wanted at the the pyramid of the sun to face straight out so so that the high priest would stand here and look straight this way and that would mark the spot right on the horizon where the star cluster Pleiades would set with the sun and that marked a key point again uh, planting and harvesting time and so uh, th this was this was a very significant sort of alignment to them. There were other uh, uh, structures here that were lined up with the planet Venus, the rising and setting of Venus. Uh, Venus rising with the sun was uh, significant because that that was also tied into rich warfare. Uh, there were other places, Zotococo, uh, south of Teotihuacan, uh, in Mexico, in which they studied eclipses. Uh, uh, they actually knew what eclipses meant uh, in terms of, of what they were. They also knew how to calculate eclipses, and they could calculate eclipses whether they were even visible from Central America or not. So the, the, uh, the people living there fully understood how eclipses work. Uh, there's a story in, in uh, that, that goes around how Columbus, when he uh, was uh, on his missions, was lining up uh, or trying trying to get get provisions. Except he didn't want to pay the natives to get provisions. He just wanted to take them. And so in the Caribbean islands, he knew that there was going to be a lunar eclipse that night. So he told the natives, you know, look, if you don't uh, provision my ships, my God's going to take away the moon. And sure enough, this lunar eclipse, and they panicked and brought him, brought him uh, provisions. If he had tried that in Central America, though, he could have said that, and the sky priest would say, oh, well, if your God takes it away, I will be stronger and make it reappear in an hour and a half. And and because uh, they understood exactly how the eclipses worked. And so that would not have worked in this location. Uh, there were other places here in Central America where the Mayans were uh, studying the sky and, and, and at certain times of the year. Uh, equinox, uh, for example, here is a, a temple that as the sun is setting, uh, the, the serpent Quetzalcoatl crawls up the side of the temple uh, by the shadows there, only at the right time of the year. And then uh, again, here in, in, in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula is another building uh, called the Caracol in which uh, it's lined up so it's partly in ruins now. Uh, but originally there were windows here that lined up with the rising and setting of Venus. And uh, there was most, uh, uh, the, the Spaniards ordered most of the books burned. Uh, um, but a few of them actually survived and were actually smuggled back to Europe. One of them actually uh, relates to this Venus and, and ties the entire calendar to observations of Venus. In fact, the, the, uh, remember Venus was so important, it was the brightest thing in the sky other than the sun and the moon. And so when Venus was doing its thing in the sky, they had ritual warfare and ritual sacrifices. Uh, much of the culture revolved around this, so the entire calendar, rather than based on seasons, the calendar was based on cycles of Venus. And so that, that was, was how the calendar throughout Mesoamerica was, was established. So what we want to do next is transition over to the Mediterranean, talk about Greek astronomy. Mesoamerican astronomy is really fascinating and there are entire books written about it, but the book discusses more Greek astronomy than it does Mesoamerican astronomy. So I want to say a little bit about that. 